1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. If you, have your, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Our house crew got some Bibles for you. Or you can use the Bible on your phone, Bible app. It's going to be the best app on your phone. That, and then following that, the Church Center app. If you haven't downloaded that yet, what are you doing? So if you, have, if you got a physical Bible, wave, wave it in the air. Wave it in the air. You guys get the fast pass to heaven. You get to skip the line. That's not true at all. There's the nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Let me put, give my uh, disclaimer. Anything I mess up, Pastor Muth is going to fix next week, okay? All right, all right. So we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. If you don't got a Bible yet, it's going to be on the screen. It says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one, everybody say one. one. Only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things they do to receive a perishable wreath, but we, but we and imperishable. Yes, or I read ahead. That's why I got distracted because I wasn't supposed to read that verse. But that's okay. Verse nine through First uh, Corinthians nine twenty-four. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. For those of you who don't know, Pastor Muta said this last week, and I'm going to co-sign. I hate running. How many of y'all in here like to run? Somebody raise their hand. I know they're lying. I'm not going to point any elbows. <laughs> Somebody raise their hand. <laughs> I hate running. And uh, one of my biggest fears was joining one of those families that, that like, did turkey trot and stuff like that <laughs> Thanksgiving morning. Like, I hear the, I live right off the river, so I hear uh, the bla them blasting the, the music, pumping people up at like 6 a.m., getting ready to run on Thanksgiving morning. The devil is a lie. It was like, I got to figure out, like, I'm going to blow out their speakers next year or something like that so they don't wake me up on Thanksgiving morning. That's one of my few days I get to sleep in, and you guys want to get up and run. You're disgusting. No. <laughs> But I hate running. But I'm going to give it up to runners. Runners are some of the most committed people. Runners, cigarette smokers, and WWE fans. <laughs> Rain, sleet, shine, runners are out there running. And I don't get it. You look cold and miserable, but you're out there running. Cigarette smokers, they'll be out there in the cold, shivering outside the apartment building like, dang. Like, that bad, huh? <laughs> oh, boy. And WWE fans, it's just too much. Like, you got Monday Night Raw, you got Thursday SmackDown. Sometimes I see Friday, they got Wednesday, like, NXT. Then you got the two-day WrestleMania. WrestleMania used to be one day, I thought. Now it's two days. It's just too much to keep up with. I don't got enough time in my schedule. But those are the most committed people on earth. And I've always hated running. I've always hated running. Now, sprints are fine. I, I love sprints. I'll get in a race. I'll race you in a heartbeat. But when it comes to, like, running distance, that's where you lose me. I'm not doing any – my wife is a cross-country uh, cross coach, and she gets up and she helps the kids run and everything. She, like, set the pace for them and all that stuff. I'm like, that's crazy. You're going to give up your summer vacation to help these kids run better? No. <laughs> You're a teacher. You should be enjoying your summer. But, no, she's out there. Well, she enjoys that, I guess. Sure. As long as you don't get me up on Thanksgiving morning and run no turkey trot. <laughs> but I, I played uh, baseball in college. So running in the offseason, we do quite a bit of running. But after my career ended, after I retired from baseball, I made a commitment to myself. I said, I'm never running again. I'm never running again. And I looked in the mirror the other day, and the six-pack wasn't six-packing. <laughs> so I was like, I'm, I might have to break that that commitment a little bit. But I remember this one summer, I came home from school. Uh, so I, I, as I mentioned, I played baseball in college. And then I came back, and my brother was doing cross country. And I was like, okay, that's weird. Why are you doing cross country? Why do you like to run? I didn't know you liked to run. And how many of y'all are, are oldest siblings in here? How many of y'all know as oldest sibling? One of y'all is lying again. Why do you keep lying? <laughs> As the oldest sibling, how many of y'all know that your younger sibling can't beat you or do anything better than you? You can't draw better than me. You can't run faster than me. 
I do dishes better than you. We're competitive with our younger siblings. I get to control the TV because I watch the best shows. So I come back, and my brother's running cross country. And I'm arrogant. So I'm like, yo, I bet you I could beat you in a race. He's like, oh, you think? He said, yeah, I bet you I could beat you in a race. Let's run around the block, see who wins. Now our block is about a mile long, right? So my friends are outside, my brother's outside. We, we hit the starting line. And Mark gets set, go. I take off. I'm thinking it's a sprint, right? I just take off. I look back, my brother's like way behind me. I hear, slow down. You're going to get tired. And I'm going to catch you. And I'm going to beat you. Shut up. Get around the first stretch, about a quarter mile. Look, he's still way behind me. He's even further behind me. So, that's right. The oldest sibling put you in your place. Slow down. You're going to get tired. And I'm going to catch you. And I'm going to beat you. You don't know nothing. I keep going. About a half mile in, like, ooh, I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> it's gaining on me a little bit. Got to put it, got to take it to the next gear. That lasts about three more strides. He starts getting closer and closer. As we round the last turn, he's even with me. And I'm tired. I look over him. Told you. He's just got a nice little pace going. I look at him. <laughs> you ain't got nothing. <laughs> Needless to say, that home stretch, after he caught up with me, he beat me by quite a bit. Because at one point, I saw how far ahead he was of me, and I just stopped. <laughs> I was breathing all hard. As I walk across the finish line, he just got this big grin on his face. I told you you were going too fast. Now, that may feel like a, a tortoise in the hair story, but this is real life. This happens. My parents have not let me live this down because once he told them, they, my parents never let me live this down. It's been like 10, 15 years, and I'm still dealing with the trauma of losing to my brother in a race. I hate running. I hate running errands. I hate running for exercise. I hate running around town. Then they text me, hey, can you run to the store real quick? Hate that. You got to run over here. You got to run over there. We're doing all this running. We spend so much time running around, and it's exhausting. Many of us just want to rest. We don't want to do anything. We just want to chill. But no, we're running everywhere. At the end of the night, I just want to do nothing. Jose put me on to something. There's a term for what I've been doing. I've been doing this for so long, I didn't know there was a term for it. It's called revenge sleep procrastination. You spend all day doing everything that you don't want to do. You don't fill it with any of the things that you want to do. So at the end of the day, instead of going to sleep because you're tired, you stay up longer just scrolling your phone, trying to find something on TV. There's nothing to watch. There's nothing going on on social media. Everybody's asleep but you. But you want revenge on the time spent that you wanted for yourself. I feel like I didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. I didn't do what I wanted to do, so I'm going to stay up later. And the only person who pays for that is you. You wake up the next morning tired and doing it all over again. But after doing all that running around, the last thing we want to do is anything productive. We spend so much time running races that aren't meant for us 
that we miss out on what God has called us to. If the things we're running to aren't of God, they're going to drain us, and we're perpetually tired, exhausted. And sometimes, if I'm honest, the last thing I want to do after a long day is get in God's Word. I'm just too tired. I just want a few minutes to myself. I just want to turn my brain off a bit, hop on Netflix. That's not healthy. When it comes down to it, we're not conditioned for the mission. Reminds me of this, this story in Mark chapter 6. So Jesus had just sent his disciples off two by two. They're going to go out preach. They're going to go out uh, healing people. They're going to go out uh, sharing the gospel with people. They're, gonna, they're just going to go out to their community and do all these things. So he sends them out two by two to make a difference, a tangible difference in their community, region, and world. And they, they get back, they return, they're tired, they're hungry, ready to just chill, unwind. Preaching takes a lot out of you. I'm, I'd be tired. In Mark 6, verse 30, it says, The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, Let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they're running around going crazy, preaching, teaching. Not going crazy, going crazy for the gospel, but uh, they're going out preaching, teaching, doing all these things. They didn't even have time to sit there, rest, and eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. That boat must have been moving slow. They got out there and sprinted to the next location. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. They were tired. They had just got done healing people, healing the sick, casting out demons, preaching. They were doing all these things. They finally got an opportunity to get some rest. But this crowd of people is like, no, we see you. We, we want more of what you got. So this crowd of people is running after them. And despite being tired, Jesus sees them and sees a need. He saw these people with genuine needs, and he stepped in. The first thing I want you to take down today, if you're taking notes, and if you're not taking notes, be serious. Take notes. No takers are history makers. The sign of a healthy soul is how quickly you bounce back. The sign of a healthy soul is how quickly you can bounce back. Jesus was likely tired like the rest of them. Jesus had been teaching, preaching, casting out demons. He was doing everything that he called the disciples to do. He taught the disciples to be able to do these things. So Jesus is fully God and fully man. So he experiences the same sensations that we experience. The Bible talks about him experiencing hunger. The Bible talks about him experiencing thirst. In this situation, Jesus is likely tired. He says, hey, let's go get some rest. But despite being tired, he receives his rest in the Father. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, come to me all who labor and are heavy, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The sign of a healthy soul is how quickly you can bounce back. How quickly can you bounce back from being tired? How quickly can you bounce back from being, uh, from being disappointed? How quickly can you bounce back from heartache? How quickly can you bounce back from frustration? How quickly can you bounce back from breakups? How quickly can you bounce back from trauma? How quickly can you bounce back from taking L? How quickly can you bounce back? Or do you sit there stuck in those feelings? stuck in those emotions. You're going to experience all of this and more. I promise you that. How quickly do you bounce back? Is your soul healthy? Let me ask you this. The second thing I want you to take away. Are you conditioned for God's mission? 
See, running builds endurance. Running builds strength. As you're running, those muscles in your body are, are tearing and building back stronger than they were before. As you're running, you learn to access more of your lung capacity to be able to gain more endurance. As you're running, you do all these things. It has all these great benefits for your body so that you can be conditioned. Athletes during the off-season workouts, we always have conditioning. I was talking to my brother earlier today. He was like, not my, my, my brother, but one of my brothers here in church, he played football. I know football, you have two-a-days. Two-a-days are miserable. Two-a-days are why I quit playing football. Because I didn't want to go to conditioning during the summer. It's insane. All that running, just like my wife, running during the summer. It's crazy to me. But during doing all that running and all that training during your conditioning period, when, so when the season starts, you won't break down. You'll have the strength to endure the season. You'll be able to play the whole season without tapering down. Are you conditioned for God's mission? They say if you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. We're running to win in 2024. One of the best ways to condition yourself, one of the best ways to withstand everything that life has to throw at you is to run to God's word. The Bible is God's word. It's our roadmap. It's our guide. God has intentionally given us this to us so that we can have his word with us. It's a living, breathing, perfect text. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, all scripture is God-breathed. Everybody say God-breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped or conditioned for every good work. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. If you're looking for encouragement, you can find that in God's word. If you're searching for purpose, discover what God has to say about you in his word. If you want to know what God's stance is on something, it's right here in his word. If you want to look for wisdom, the Bible is full of it. So I want, to, I want you to understand the power of his word. If you go all the way back to Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke the universe into existence. That's the power of God's voice. All Scripture, we talked about earlier, all Scripture is God-breathed. That means that you have the access in this to change the course of the universe. You have the power in this to create something out of nothing. And some of us have the power, the same power is with us at 24-7 in our phones. If you have the Bible app, you have access 24-7 to God's power. It's a resource. We get to carry around the power to change the universe on our phone. We have unlimited access to God's word and God's voice. But so many of us lack the desire to access it. Let me be clear, it's a lack of desire. You don't get what you want, you get what you're committed to. I'm think about, I'm a big sports fan. Notre Dame football is my jam. So I'll be online looking up the recruits they're recruiting. I'll be online looking up uh, how, how the players are looking in spring practice. I'll be online looking up uh, the things Coach Freeman's saying, all these things. I will research the mess out of some Notre Dame football. Cubs baseball, glue. As many of the 162 games as I can, glue. Got the MLB network. So I got MLB.tv so I can watch any game I want, anytime I want. Glue. You might not be a sports person. You might be a movie person. New movie comes out, you're at the theater. 
You, you have a favorite director that you, you love their movies, so you know everything about their movies. You know all about the casting. You know all about uh, uh, what this scene was supposed to represent and this, the deep intricacies of cinema and all these deep things that you learn and you study about movies. If you're a music fan, you're probably up yesterday deciphering all the lyrics of the Drake beef. <laughs> Drake dropped the diss track and people were running to rap genius trying to figure out what he meant by things he said. Then Rick Rocks dropped a, a diss track right after that. You were probably reading up on that too. You've been all in tune to all this, this drama surrounding the rap game right now. You might have gotten uh, Beyonce's album and been, well, what's she mean by this? And will she get the proper credit she deserves in the country music industry? And all these things. We spend all this time studying all this stuff. If you're, if you're, if you're into health and fitness, oh, I got to learn the new exercises. Oh, maybe, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can eat this meal plan. Maybe I can. We do all this time researching and looking into things that we care about, but give God excuses. I'm just too tired. I'm just too busy. Not too busy for Facebook. I see y'all on here all day. Not too busy to watch Netflix and tell me about all the movies that are coming out on Netflix. Hey, did you see this? No, I did not. That sounds stupid. Give all the excuses. I just don't understand what I'm reading. Ask someone to help you. One of the, one of the biggest blessings I had is one of my brothers here at the church came up to me. He's like, yo, Pastor Lewis. I feel like God is calling me to something more. God is calling me to take those next steps in my journey, next steps in my commitment. And the thing that's holding me back is I don't understand what I'm reading when I read the Bible. Can you help me to understand and read? Can you spend time with me reading the Bible and helping me in this journey? Absolutely. So now we get together on Wednesdays. We have a Bible plan that we do throughout the week. And then we come together. We read the scripture together. We talk about what he's read. We talk about what he's retained. We talk about how we can continue to grow and learn in those areas. And now he's continuing to blossom. And I'm watching him continue to grow. That's not an excuse. I don't like reading. I don't like reading either. I hate reading almost as much as I hate running. We have YouTube. They'll read the scriptures to you on YouTube. You have street lights. It's a dope ministry. We support them as a church. We support the people at street lights. We have audio books and podcasts. There's all these resources available. If you don't get fulfillment out of sitting down and reading and you get distracted, we have audio opportunities as well. There's no excuse. If you have to watch Veggie Tales to get the Bible stories in, <laughs> what? There's no excuse. At the end of the day, are you more committed to your narrative or to your breakthrough? Are you more committed to your narrative or are you committed to your breakthrough? We should desire to get to the point where we're, where we're so in love and hungry for Jesus that we, we just can't do anything without him. We cut all, all the excuses. God, I want to hear directly from you. I want to just sit in your presence, God. Reveal to me what you're trying to speak to me, Lord. Show me what you want me to see, God. Reveal to me who you want me to see, God. Reveal to me in your word what you have in store for my life, God. Show me. Unlock in me what you want to unlock in me, God. I want to hear directly from you. I want to sit in your presence. When you do that, you'll find out that when you read the Bible, it's not you reading it, it's it reading you. It has the power to change you from the inside out. You begin to think like God. You begin to love like God. You begin to see like God. I'm telling you, the Bible is powerful. They say you are what you eat. But that's more true spiritually than it is physically. We have constant inputs coming into our bodies. We're constantly being inundated by numerous things, whether that be the radio as we're driving, whether that be people's conversations at work, 
whether that be uh, at the supermarket. We're constantly fed with ads. We're constantly fed with distractions. We're constantly feeding ourselves as well as we're, as we're driving. What are you putting on the stereo? As, as your Stereo, I sounded old. <laughs> stereo. All right. <laughs> what are you listening to on your Apple Music? What are you listening to uh, on your Spotify? What are you listening to on podcast-wise? We have all these things that are filling our bodies and our minds. You are what you eat. What are you consuming? The Word of God is how you change your diet. Because what you think, you will become. If we want to be different, we have to start thinking different. If you want to feel different, you've got to feed different. How are you feeding yourselves? You're either feeding yourself or somebody else is feeding you. And you don't necessarily know what they're feeding you. I want to share four benefits of reading God's word. You guys with me? You guys with me? God's word is going to make you strong. The first thing, God's word is going to make you strong. Prayer is our word to God, but the Bible is God's word to us. It's a two-way communication. Anybody in a relationship knows that if you're the only one talking, the relationship likely isn't going too well. It means you're probably not doing enough listening. God's word to us is through the Bible. It's one thing to be in prayer. I love, love having a good prayer life, and I'm praying in the car. I'm doing all these things, but am I listening for God's word through his scriptures? The word of God will make you strong by giving you life. If that's a transformation you can't get from anything else, the word of God is not just an inspiration to want to be different. It's a spirit power to be different. In John 6, it says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. <laughs> the words I have spoken to you are spirit in life. As we try to do these things on our own, as we try to try to uh, power our journey by ourselves, we, we're doing it by the power of our own flesh. And God's like, no, you need me. You need my spirit. You need my strength. You need me to come alongside you. The Bible is what is going to make you strong. God's word is going to make you strong. The second thing I want, to, want you to learn, the word of God will bring clarity to you. There's so many distractions out there we talked about earlier. We talked about all the things that get in our way of having an authentic counter, encounter with God through worship. We have, oh, during worship, I thought of 17 different things that got in my way of receiving what God had. Thought of, oh, I got this bill to pay tomorrow. Oh, I got, I got to get my clothes ironed for work this week. I got to go pick up uh, groceries after this. I got, to, I got to do this. I got to mow the lawn. Lawn's starting to get long. Got to mow the lawn. You start thinking of all these different things, all these distractions in your life, and the word of God is meant to bring clarity. It cuts through all the mess and makes it all clear for us. You never have to ask God where you stand. You never have to ask God where you stand with him because it's right there. You constantly know where you stand, and you constantly know what's right if you're in your word. It brings strength and identity to your heart. And that clarity that you get leads to freedom. And John, it says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Clarity leads to freedom. Next thing I want you to learn, is God's word is going to keep you strong. It's not only going to make you strong, but it's going to keep you strong. The word of God convicts us. As I'm reading this, I feel conviction in my heart, and God begins to do heart surgery on me, and he begins to reveal things in my life that where I'm falling short, he begins to reveal things in my life and that where I'm not thinking like God. He begins to reveal things in my life that makes me love better and wants, want to be more Christ-like. The conviction of God 
leads to the change in God, which leads to the blessings in God. The conviction of God leads to the change in God, which leads to the blessings of God. God's word will protect you. And the word of God gives us wisdom. In Joshua 1, 8, it says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. Everybody say, day and night. Like, I'll be sure. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. It says there's a direct correlation between studying God's word, meditating it on daily, on it daily, and continuing to grow in his word, and then you will prosper and succeed in all that you do. There's a direct correlation between God's word and your success. Y'all ain't feeling me in here. That's all right. I'm going to keep preaching what God has to say. God's word is going to help you recover when you become weak. As we talked about God's word making us strong and keeping us strong, there's times where we fall off. There's times where we, we, we get in our own way. When, when temptation sets in and we give in to, 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 to temptation, there's times where we give in to frustration. There's times when we stumble and fall because we as humans are weak. But God's word gives the strength to help us recover in those times when we become weak. The word of God will bring stability to you in these areas when you make a mistake and when you fall short. Hope will begin to rise in your heart again. In other words, God's word will condition you for God's mission. Are you conditioned for God's mission? I was talking to my brother-in-law yesterday. We were visiting family. My brother-in-law was a, a uh, former cross-country star, star, like six-time All-State in tracking cross country, went to run in college, messed up his knee, and that ended his career. But he has not run in several years. When he was done, much like me, he retired from running. And he decided on a whim he was going to run a 5K. Now, this is a guy who, who spent many years training and perfecting his body, making sure that he was able to withstand these long distances he's running. But he had been atrophied in this because he had not done it for so long. How many of you know when you stop working out a muscle, it start, stops working as effectively as it once did? So as he's deciding to get back into running these races, he decides, I'm just going to jump straight into this 5K. And as he begins to run, he's telling me, he says, as he began to run, he started off at the pace that he once had. He took off, much like me against my brother. I don't want to talk about it anymore. He takes off, and he starts running. And he's realizing as he's running, man, my muscles aren't using, working the way that I'm used to. Say, man, I felt like I only had a quarter of my lung capacity. I wasn't operating it on full strength. And as he's running, he's begin, beginning to get frustrated. He's like, dang, I should just quit. This is terrible. I feel awful. This doesn't feel good. And as he's running, he's like, man, I, I just want to quit. But then he remembered the goal. Then he remembered the prize. He remembered the purpose behind what he was doing. He remembered his why. And as he's running, he has the mental strength and the mental fortitude to keep going and to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. And then he did not quit, and he crossed the finish line with an amazing time. As he crossed the finish line, he looked up at his time, and he's like, man, I didn't think I did that well. And that reminds me so much of Jesus' time here on earth. As Jesus comes down, he, he steps down from his throne of glory. He steps down from heaven and humbles himself into less than perfect conditions. Born a babe in a manger, surrounded by animals, unsanitary conditions. And as he's running this, this race of life, he's running this perfect race. But he knew what he was going to experience on the cross. He had that pain to look forward to. And it says that he's, he's, he's praying to God in the Garden of the Gethsemane. He said, 
uh, God, if you can remove this from me, but not my will, yours be done. Because he stayed focused on the mission. He stayed focused on the prize. He knew what race he was running. And it says as he, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so stressful. He was so stressed that it said that his sweat was drops of blood. And he continued to reflect on the goal. And at that moment, he could have quit, but he didn't quit. And he endured a beating. He endured being mocked. He endured being judged. He endured being spit on. That would have probably did it for me. You spit on me, we're fighting. <laughs> he endures all these things with his goal in mind. And now you can come up. But he remembered his goal and he didn't quit. And when he died on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. He finished his race. Because of his sacrifice, we have the opportunity to have a relationship with God. And we have access to his word. It's all because of Christ's sacrifice. There's so many things in this life that are going to distract you. We all have a purpose in Christ. God has destined us all for our own individual race. Are you conditioned for that mission? As we're running, as we're pursuing Christ, as we're pursuing our purpose in Christ, God has gifted us with a resource, our second wind. God is, his, his, this scripture is God breathed. And as you're ingesting God's word, it's like you're ingesting God's breath and he's filling your lungs with everything that you need to run your race. And I don't know about many of you in here. I, I don't want to assume that everybody in here is a believer. I don't want to assume that everyone has the best relationship with Christ. I don't want to assume that, that you guys have all been running a perfect race, because I know I have. And sometimes we quit the race like I did against my brother. Sometimes we, we stop short of what God has called us to. Sometimes we we start running a different race altogether. So I want to give you the opportunity today to recommit yourself to the conditioning that it takes to be on mission with Christ. I want to give you the opportunity today to recommit yourself to the journey with Christ, getting to know him more, getting to know what he wants for you, getting to know what his desire for your life is. So many times I hear, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? Let God tell you. Let God define that for you. So as we close out, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, I want to give you that opportunity today. I want you, in this moment, to just reflect on your journey with Christ. Reflect on the last thing he told you to do. If you are in here today, and your journey has been less than perfect, you got distracted, you quit your race, whatever your story is, I'm sure several other people in here have experienced the same story as you. You're not alone. So if you in here today want to recommit your life to Christ, or maybe you have not given your life to Christ at all, maybe you just are at your wit's end, or this is your last-ditch effort of, of I'm just going to do this because I'm, I'm, life is just too much for me, and I just need direction. I'm telling you, a life lived with Christ 
We'll give you everything you need. We'll answer all the questions that you have. We'll equip you for your future. So if that's you today, I'm talking to one of two people. If, if you are recommitting your life to Christ and recommitting to your race, or if you want to begin your race and you want to begin this, this journey of a life with Jesus, the same Jesus who came down from heaven and died on your behalf, knowing that, that you would need a Savior one day. If that's you in here today, while all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, I just ask that you raise your hand. Just slip your hand in the air. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Hands raised all over the room. God, we just thank you so much for each and every one of these hands raised because they represent a soul. We know that the currency of heaven is soul. So we, we want to uh, just continue to, to do what we can to bring people closer to you, God. So I'm praying that as several of these people raise their hand to, to make that commitment to you, Lord, or to recommit to you, God, that you seal that commitment, that you continue the good works that you've started in there, Lord. I pray that, that you just continue to lift them up, encourage them, surround them with community, surround them with people who are going to continuously point them towards you and keep them on the right path. God, I pray that you condition us for your mission. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, if, if you struggle with reading the Bible, I don't want to just leave you high and dry. I want to give you uh, uh, just a quick resource on five things that you can do. Can we get that on the screen? Five keys to better understand the Bible and five questions to ask when reading the Bible. The first thing is, remember the big picture. What is this all about? Find the context. What does this mean? Number three, understand the implications. What does this mean for me? Number four, apply it to your life. As I'm going through life, what is God trying to teach me? Number five, just read it. You may be wondering, where do I start? Do I start in Genesis? Do I start in Matthew? Where do I start? And what I always say is, start with what interests you. We're more likely to stick to something that interests us. If, if you want to learn more about worshiping God or just want to sing God's worship, go to the Psalms. Start there. If you want to learn more about God's creation and how God built this whole universe and, and how he started his journey with us as believers, start in Genesis. If you want to learn about God, Christ's walk on earth and all the things that he, he uh, dealt with on earth in his perfect sinless life, start in the Gospels. If you want to learn about the early church, start in Acts. There's several things that we can do. There's several places we can start. If you still don't know where to start, find me. I love you guys. I want to see to it that you guys each build an authentic relationship with Christ that is yours and yours alone. I want to see to it that you guys experience your purpose in Christ and discover what he has to say about you. So if you need help finding a place to start in the Bible, we can meet after this. All right? I love you guys. Praise God for all that he is because he's awesome in this. It has nothing to do with me.